the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giuliano, she, her, and hers, and I'm the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I'm very excited to welcome our next guest to the interview series, Mi Duan Kong. She is the VP of People at Acquire. Mi, thank you so much for being here. If you want to share a little bit about yourself for our listeners, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly you answered the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Christina, for having me. Um, as uh, you, you know, thanks for the intro. I am currently the VP of People at Acquire. So pretty much spent a lot of my career in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, um, you know, I've been at bigger companies and smaller companies doing HR as well as recruiting. I am, um, you know, a lot of where my favorite places to work are really just sort of startups, you know, where you're sort of really scaling and trying to build the company and the business. Um, when I was little, I did not dream about human resources. I don't think I even knew what it was. Yeah. I definitely thought, you know, because you watch so many of those like romantic comedies or something, I thought I was going to have like a fun New York City job at a magazine, sure. taking pictures of dresses <laughs> and getting free samples of things. But um, that was that was what I wanted to do when I was a kid. <laughs> I not love really that answer. answer. Yes, fast forward to today, you mentioned you're the, the VP of people and you have a lot of experience with startups and building a team and something from scratch as well. How do you think your personal journey has really impacted uh, you to be specifically at Acquire and be uh, in the people HR space? Yeah, so, you know, my personal journey was, you know, I graduated college. I went through a rotational program where I was trained to do a human resources at like you know, one of the oldest companies in America, right? Um, where things were unionized and HR was very much what you would expect like traditional HR to be. Like administer people's benefits and give put people on pips and also make sure that, you know, you don't get the company sued. Um, and it wasn't until I started to branch outside of that, started, you know, move to San Francisco, started to see how different tech companies were experimenting with actually HR as a, uh, an engaging uh, as an like an engager mm -hmm. versus policer and that was really something that spoke to me and you know startups just sort of allow you to be more creative it just allows you to have more freedom without the without the inflexibility of working you know in such a giant space mm -hmm. right so I, I would say that I've definitely evolved to want to do more of the experimental creative aspects of like engaging people and I think that startups are just like a good atmosphere in which to do that. Absolutely. A great opportunity to be innovative, especially over the past few years and redesigning, taking down and creating new systems as well to make sure that people feel included, that they belong at the organization. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about kind of what people would think of human resources to be with uh, PIPs and benefits and just uh, all the perceptions around it. Where do you think the current uh, kind of viewpoint or perception is today around people, people operations, human resources, whatever you want to kind of call it or what folks call it in their team uh, today. Yeah, you know, I would say that, look, if it, I can understand if you're at a very big old company, you know, why those things are important, right? Why the process and the compliance stuff matters. But I am of the philosophy that if you treat people well, that is actually one of the best risk mitigators that you could possibly have, right? I often see like, you know, some HR folks will over-index on PIPs, documentation, doing different things. And there's gonna be HR people that debate me on this for sure. My philosophy has always been give people a choice, be honest and transparent with them about where they stand. Um, you know, let's say for instance, you're performance managing someone. I don't think I've, I've hardly ever seen a PIP turnaround performance. What I have seen are honest, empathetic conversations drive forward decisions, both for the company and for that employee. 
that is much more helpful than you know going the compliance route. So for me, I would say that like if you are working in HR today and you're not thinking from an EQ perspective, from how do I motivate people perspective, how do I speak to people, how do I show empathy, I think your job is just going to be a lot harder. You know, people see through these things now. They see through what a PIP is. It's just a legal document to keep, get them out. You know, they see through these different things, and I think it's important that we have to adapt. And I and I think like people want to be treated like adults, and they want to be told the truth want to be treated well, treated like adults, have that flexibility. And you're right, people can tell when you're being authentic as a person, as an organization, as a leader, um, or whether you're just looking to check a box as well. And some of the questions that you asked, you wouldn't necessarily be asking them 20 years ago at a large organization. And I know in our previous conversation, when you were interviewing for this job, you were also interviewing uh, senior leaders at, at Acquire. What questions did you ask uh, kind of acquire CEO and other leaders to gauge whether their uh, commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion was actually authentic. Yeah, so I was actually the first executive that Acquire hired, which, you know, I think should say a lot about the company itself, right? Like uh, what it prioritizes when it was thinking about building out its leadership team. Of course, recruiting was on the mind as people were scaling. But um, one of the, you know, one of the questions that I always like to ask is, you know, a lot of folks will ping me because they like the DEI work that has like that I've done or like, you know, my stance on DEI, I think I, t I tend to have, I tend to be more vocal um, about certain things around DEI, what we do well and what we don't do well. One of the questions that I, I like to ask the CEO is like, why do you care about DEI? Like, why does it matter to you? I run away from answers like, well, it's good for business or it's the right thing to do. It, you know, to me, like DEI, especially at a startup where you're trying to scale, DEI can actually slow down the business in the short term. And it may not actually be like, you know, the best thing for the business for you to slow it down immediately when you're trying to scale the company. And so I'm always weary about like those intentions because I'm weary about going into a place where DEI will be performative. The real thing I'm looking to hear is stuff like, I believe that systems have made things unequal and I want to use my company as a vehicle to resolve that. Yeah. Uh, I do believe that I have certain privileges as the CEO, as a male CEO, as a white CEO, whatever you would call it. And I want to open, create opportunities for other people. So when you ask, you know, anybody at Acquire, why do you do DEI? And especially when you ask a member of the leadership team, you actually get the answer, you know, they don't actually even use the word CEI. They just say, we believe in creating equal opportunities. And that purpose is much greater than like, well, just do DEI for the sake of DEI, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I think those are interesting kind of answers because I think we've all heard kind of the business case around diversity, equity, and inclusion um, and doing it because it's the right thing or, or nice to have, but understanding the historical and societal uh, kind of context behind it. And if you're doing things intentionally, it is kind of slowing things down and you have to have this realistic perspective on it too. Yeah, absolutely. I would absolutely agree with that. Um, I have a kind of question around kind of what this looks like in practice, especially from a leadership perspective. I think modeling is super important in today's kind of day and age. What does modern, progressive, and effective leadership look like to you? I think, you know, I was actually just reading an article about this. Modern and effective leadership um, has a lot to do with influence. And I think like a lot of people discount the power of EQ and the power of being really people first and truly empathetic when you are trying to figure out how to influence folks, right? I see people struggle and like there's different forms of uh, authority, right? Different forms of power. And I think the biggest struggles that I see when I work with leaders and I work with different executives is people don't know how to influence through, through relationships. I think a modern leader really puts a lot of stake in relationships and not just relationships for the sake of them, right? Relationships so that people can come to an understanding so that people are all on the same boat together and driving in the same direction. And I think like, you know, modern, modern leadership really needs to focus on empathy and trying to understand, you know, people's pain points and really helping to get them on board with you. Mm -hmm. I think empathy and leading with vulnerability is one of the kind of major changes we've seen as well with leaders and really an expectation from employees or potential kind of team members as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. In terms of that kind of getting specific in equity, inclusion, and diversity, I know there's been a, a lot of conversations around referral programs and if it is kind of a great equalizer or if done well, um, or you just shouldn't have one because you attract folks who went to the same school or in your same societal social circles, what is your opinion on referral, referral programs for uh, new talent? Yeah, well, I, you know, I wanna say that it's a complex answer for sure, right? If you diversify your company well enough, then referrals can actually serve to better diversify the company. Um, if you have not done a good job of diversifying your company, I think referrals work the other way. And so to me, it's quite situational. Um, the one thing that I would caution different folks on is, you know, a lot of times when new executives come in, they want to, or new leaders come in, they want to have a referral program where they bring people from other companies, right? Mm -hmm. I think that ultimately that could create culture stinks in the sense that like the people you know also will tend to be the people you like because you've worked with them in the past and the people you promote. And so for me, referrals are definitely something that have to be utilized and monitored through a process. So don't just have referrals where people come into the company, right? Make sure that your referral has a process in which they follow, one in which there is input from other folks who don't know your referral mm -hmm. and make it fair. Um, but just realize that wherever your company starts on that diversity, like in that, diver in that diversification is what the referral will enhance. So if you are a company made up of, you know, all white guys from Stanford, you're generally probably gonna get referrals of all white guys from Stanford. Right. If your company is more diverse, then the diversity changes and, and, you know, and it will seek to enhance. But I say, you know, always use moderately. Nothing is ever good in, in bulk. <laughs> yeah, not good and bad and definitely want to be intentional around and put up those kind of operationalizing um, equity, having folks really talk to people who don't know your referral as well. Um, and there's no one size fits all approach, but thinking about it critically um, in terms of when you're interviewing kind of acquires CEO and his commitment to um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, one of the things you said was kind of acknowledging that privilege and the positionality of, of an organization too. Um, from your perspective, what role do you see kind of private companies playing in creating more equity in the world? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question, Christina. For me, look, I, you know, one conversation I've had in the past is I think DEI work is not just at the company. I think there are personal levels, which you as an individual will go out there to the world and make equal. And then there are group levels, mm -hmm. as in within your company, and then societal levels that we as a society need to do. I think that companies serve as great vehicles to make those things equal. And I think companies, even private companies, and especially private companies to an extent, because they have more flexibility than right. bigger companies, have a role to slow down and, and to some extent, look at the opportunity where they sit at and know that they can create opportunities for other folks. They're not imbued, they're not blocked by more processes, right? They're not blocked by rules, regulations, laws. They have the ability to work nimbly. And I do think so, I, I do think the obligation should be pretty large for private companies to look at their teams today and make the call to say, look, we can slow down some things to have the right makeup for our team. And in order to have the right makeup, we have to change certain behaviors at the company itself mm -hmm. to make sure that we can bring certain, make, like, you know, certain ethnicities or um, genders or whatever it is into our company that we don't have. Yeah, I definitely agree with you, especially in the community that the organization operates in, accessibility to opportunities that you're providing as well. Providing employment is a huge um, opportunity and kind of providing more equity in the spaces that we are in. Can you tell me about how you, as, a, as the first kind of other executive, have kind of redesigned or iterated on a system to be more inclusive or equitable over the past um, kind of couple of months? And it can be a process, policy, or, or initiative. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in 2020, uh, I joined, I think, Acquire around 2020. Um, and when I joined, I was the first hire into the people function. And I quickly hired um, an HR leader and then a, a recruiting leader. And I cannot take, you know, credit for the work they've done because they've, you know, busted their butts on this. 
But one thing that we decided as a company was that DEI hiring would be really important, but it wouldn't be, you know, recruiter recruiting is a partnership. It's not a like, hey, you're going to do what I say. And, uh, you know, you can't have a DEI program. You can't have strong DEI um, in your company if recruiting is not a partnership. And one of the things that we determined was a partnership also comes with accountability on both ends, right? So on my team as recruiters, we actually ask that every few candidate, like every candidate that's brought, let's say, you know, we run a little bit of a different process. So rather than like give the hiring manager 20 candidates to talk to, they may get five. Mm-hmm. Of those five, there are two or three profiles they really, really, uh, they had put down that they want. And then two profiles that we ask them to speak to that they may not have considered before and may want to like kind of take a look. On the executive side, we actually have executive goals. Mm -hmm. Um, And so each executive is given a goal for the makeup of their their team based on team size. Um, But it also is also, you know, a goal around like sort of diversity and inclusion as well. So outside of just the makeup of your team, where is that sense of belonging? And then we also map that up to how is the team performing, right? And so executives are held accountable to a certain makeup and then it goes to like, you know, the company. And so we can take a look at that change. And when that was implemented, I would say that we did a lot to increase um, our company, um, you know, like sort of diversity at the company. Yeah, I appreciate that, the point around accountability as well and kind of the goals too with, leaders. I think we've seen a lot of kind of headlines around how large uh, organizations have been doing it too, but it's never too early to start and have those conversations. Again, having that partnership and accountability, not for one person or team, but for everybody involved and really measuring what's working and what needs to be improved upon. Um, I just attended kind of a a conference around uh, kind of, you know, human resources, where are we going in the future? And one of the panels talked about um, kind of the role of private companies too, like we were talking about. Um, and I love this question. So I wanted to ask you kind of how Acquire is intentionally not perpetuating kind of trauma that is happening outside, externally in the world that everyone is kind of facing, but more groups, uh, some groups more than others um, and not bringing that internally at Acquire. Some examples might be kind of more mental gymnastics for women of color, microaggressions, societal inequities, uh, what have you. Yeah, you know, I think one thing that Acquire does really well is our self-awareness and our sense of like being honest with ourselves and with each other. So when I first joined, you know, I think I got a question around like, hey, Juneteenth is coming up. Are we taking the day off? Like, what are we doing? Shouldn't, you know, everybody else is taking the day off. And I looked at our company makeup and I said, we have hired no black people at this company. We haven't done the work. Like, uh, so what does taking a day off on Juneteenth mean mm-hmm. if we haven't? Done the work. And so the a year later, I think it was like our African American black uh, you know, demographic jumped up to I think it was like 10%, 12%. And the question about Juneteenth came up again. And it was sort of like, well, now me, now we've got this makeup, what should we do? And I go, I know what I'm gonna do. I went to them, you know, the uh black talent in our company. I said, what is the right thing to do here? And the feedback I got was feels weird to us, you know, to have like a day off on, you know, on the backs of some, like a terrible event, you know, for folks to have a day off if we're not guaranteed that people are going to learn anything. And so the deal we made with the company was if we get 70% of the company to buy from a black owned business or go to an event where they learn something and enough uh, receipts are submitted uh, at 70%, then next month you can have a day off or a long weekend. And so for us, like we definitely are very honest. And I think that like, we don't do performative things. And I think performative things cause more harm outside. So go, to go back to your question, I think like we, we can admit where we failed and then choose not to do the performative thing. Mm-hmm. And then choose to involve those members of the groups that it impacts. Because I do think it would be like a very performative and harmful thing for our black talent if we just all took Juneteenth off without considering their feelings on it, without having that conversation. And so I would say that's kind of where I land there with the choir. 
I love that. I think self-awareness and the internal work with a capital W is so important to this equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging conversation as well. Um, and goes back to your earlier point too of being creative of how we are celebrating and honoring something from a historical context too. Oh, along the lines of kind of that accountability, I know you mentioned kind of goals for leaders and executives. What is your kind of overall philosophy with measuring kind of DEI goals, knowing that, you know, this is not a check the box situation where you want to say we've created this equitable work environment, so we don't have to work on this this quarter, but what gets measured gets invested in and we want to make sure that if something is not working, uh, it's, it's changed. Right. Um you know, I would say that like before anybody sets goals, they really have to understand what their intent is, right? Like, you know, you don't just want to set arbitrary goals. And I've seen bad goals be set. They'll just be like, ah, oh, you know, uh, higher, higher, you know, try to get to 50% women. Don't say anything about ethnicity though, because we, we can't keep track of that at the beginning. And I think it's just, it, it kind of sucks. <laughs> and so for us, it's like, you know, every company is different. Some companies are already at 60% or 50%, um, you know, uh, women or underrepresented genders. And they don't need to have those goals, right? Um, maybe they need to look at diversification goals or sense of belonging. Maybe even though you're at 50% women, inclusion is not really felt for some reason because only the leadership are men, right? And so I do think that goals are very subjective to the company that they are at and they should be specific. At Acquire, we definitely put an emphasis on ethnicity and gender. Mm -hmm. um, and then we took the path of like, let's just do this thing one at a time, right? And then there are, you know, there are rewards for the executive to um, exceed their goals greatly. And then there's actually that counter, you know, like um, accountability, like we said, if the goals are so far, like, you know, they're so far from being met. Um, that being said, like we also, you know, at first when we were thinking about, should we really give an incentive? We decided let's give an incentive if they greatly exceed because we're not giving an incentive to do the bare minimum. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are just these trade-offs that I think are very complex, but all I can say about setting goals is it really should be specific to your company. It should really be something that there is accountability. Your CEO stands behind it because if your CEO does not stand behind it, it's pretty much useless. Like nobody's going to follow up and the follow-up will be performative. And so, um, you know, those are the two things I would say. I think that goes back to kind of intentionality too. And why are we setting these goals? Is it to be performative and pat ourselves on the back for doing this? Is it because we want to, we've looked at where we are today and want to kind of look at where we are aspirationally as well and having that accountability and ownership mentality too. Um, we know that when we're testing new strategies out, when we are doing things for the first time, mistakes are about to happen, especially when you're having uh, these conversations. Are there any uh, common mistakes? You don't have to name any names, of course, that you see companies or leaders still making in their people or talent strategy. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I, yeah, I do see a common mistake. And I, I uh, for me, it's not, I guess it's hard for me to call it mis a mistake because, you know, at this day and age, it shouldn't still be a mistake, mm -hmm. which is like, I often see really beautiful DEI careers pages, right? About like, oh, this is the work that we've done. And like, I've, I've started to kind of put down a list of like, what I call like fake DEI pages for marketing, <laughs> which is like where people put uh, the goals, you know, they put a nice philosophy, they put the goals that they have, they put their intention, and then they put down like, you know, you know, when stuff like Black Lives Matter or Me Too movement happens, they put a nice logo and then they put it on that website. But I don't see the actions, right? I don't see the actions. I go to the glass door and I don't see it reflected or I go to even just the page itself when they're not willing to share the actual makeup, but just the goals. That's how I can tell like, okay, you know, you're not holding yourself accountable, right? Mm -hmm. Um and, and one thing I will say is like when companies go out there so publicly, you know, even when I first started, we, we were hesitant when Black Lives Matter was happening to even put out an icon or to even say anything. Right. So, uh, you know, our CEO made the decision that he would donate money 
And then if we want to talk about it, we want to talk about it. So you'll see that like, even from acquire, we've only begun to join the DEI conversation. We've only begun in Silicon Valley to come out there and say, this is what we've been doing as a sharing best practices, because until you actually have done the work and we feel like we are so far from actually having done that work, yeah. it just doesn't feel right. You know, it, at some point, then you're again, taking advantage of the groups. It's like, you know, those DEI pages with the very diverse workforces because you picked the five brown people that you have in your company to pose for the website. I think that that does a lot more harm than it does good. And so for me, like over marketing what you're doing, I'm not sure that it's very authentic. Mm -hmm. Over marketing what you're doing or just kind of sharing what you would like to do uh, before you do it. Uh, and that intent versus impact uh, discussion that we were talking about earlier too, I think is, is really important to, to think about. Um, and is your environment set up for success for when more people of color or black talent can come into your environment too and being really honest, acknowledging where you are, um, like you said as well. Mia, is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to share with folks who are listening or maybe re kind of underscoring one to two key takeaways you hope people in this space kind of bring with them? Yeah, you know, I would say, you know, the one, two key takeaways, we've been talking about DEI quite a bit in the work. I would say be authentic, be honest with yourself and do the right thing when it comes to these things. So those would be my three key takeaways. I love it. Some good uh, calls to action that folks can can think about. Me, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. I enjoyed our conversation. Thank you, Christina. And thanks for having me. Of course. And as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we believe in all employees being seen, heard, and understood. And now it's a requirement for the business to succeed overall. Have a great rest of your afternoon, everyone.